Tonight is our second of nine that we're going to have this year. Richard uh, Grandin, Grandin, excuse me, I knew I was going to get it wrong as many times as I tried, is our speaker. He was an Army infantryman during World War II. Uh, he was in for 11 months of combat at that time. He uh, got the, uh, let me see here, uh, Purple Heart and the Bronze uh, Star. And he has obviously written a book, a paraphrase from the book, a rifle uh, man sighting from the rim of his foxhole cannot see nor think ideas. There is no honor, there is no glory, he has no desire to be a hero. If he thinks at all, it is only to wonder why he is where he is and doing what he is doing. Well, tonight we're very pleased to have him here and tell his story for us. So would everybody welcome Richard Grandin. Okay, can you hear me? <laughs> Too bad, you probably say. He said he didn't... Uh, he was not that man in the picture, and I looked at him when I came in, and I don't think I'm the guy in the picture either. I didn't recognize him, and it surprised me. Uh, my family had gotten a hold of this and got it up here, and I didn't know I was going to be here. But anyway, he looks a little bit familiar, so um, I want to thank particularly uh, Tim uh, Burns for inviting me, for Mike uh, Eady for pinch hitting and emceeing, and particularly for all you people who came out on a night like tonight with uh, Michigan State playing basketball tonight. I am very gratified and honored that you should show up with everything else going on. <clears throat> I want to uh, begin, I guess, by saying that there's a, I, I know a few people out here in the room and I know there's a lot of you, maybe most of you, who know a lot more about World War II than I do. If you've read, and I'm sure you have, and you've listened to other speakers who are much better adapted at speaking than I am, I'm sure you, could, you can probably tell me a lot more about World War II than what I can tell you. Um, there are many generals, many admirals, many colonels, many highfalutin people way up here that have made a lot of money writing books and giving speeches. And if you've followed them or heard them or read them, then I can't tell you anything you don't already know. <clears throat> if you go down this chart, I am way down here. <laughs> uh, uh, my daughter Beth agreed to print this up for me because I thought maybe a lot of people might not know how a, an army organization uh, is established on the so-called table of organization. Um, the army is basically made up of three units. Really, no matter what unit you're in, you're part of a basic three. And you have at the top, for example, the first army at the beginning of the war in Europe was commanded by General Bradley. Uh, not long after we were in the first army, they took a few units from the first army and established the third army under General Patton. So most of the time that I was in combat, I was under General Patton. And every army is made up of corps. And corps are usually two corps to an army, sometimes three corps, sometimes only one. Within each corps are 
more than one division, usually three divisions. The reason for the breakdown of threes is that you are never in combat as a member of any one of these units. You are never in combat all the time. You, um, if you're in the uh, 12th Corps, the 90th Division may be on the line, the 29th Division may be on the line, but there will always be a division in, in reserve. And the reason for this setup, and I don't know um, whether other countries have the same type of army set up or not, but there's always a unit in reserve. And for example, I was in the 90th Division. When the 90th Division was in reserve and one of the other two are online, or maybe two of them are online, that's when you get a break. And if it's a division that's in reserve, you're usually in back of the line 15, 20 miles, or whatever. Uh, the divisions are broken down into regiments. There are always three regiments to an infantry division. I happen to be in the 357th Regiment, and the 358th and 359th were all part of the 90th Division. I did not go into combat on D-Day. The 90th Division, part of the 90th Division did. The 359th Regiment was in on D-Day uh, as an attachment to the 4th Division. But I won't get into all that. But anyway, on the 357th, is broken down into battalions, and we had the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Battalion in the 357th Regiment, and I happened to be in the 1st Battalion. 1st Battalion was broken down into four companies. There were three rifle companies, Company A, Company B, Company C, and Company D, which is a uh, heavy weapons company. Um, again, if Company A is in combat and Company B is in combat, Company C is in reserve. You always have a unit, as I say, in reserve in case one of the companies gets in trouble. They can always bring up a reserve unit to help get them out of trouble. Basically, it's very simple. So, um, occasionally, when you get into a lot of trouble, you may have all of the units, all three units in a battalion in action at the same time. But that seldom happens. Company A, was, Company A was broken down into three platoons. You have three infantry platoons and a fourth platoon, which again is a machine gun and a mortar platoon. Platoons are broken down into squads. Uh, first, second, and third squad, then a fourth squad uh, with weapons, heavy weapons. And I don't know why. <laughs> I happened to be in the 1st Corps during combat in the 90th Division, which was the 1st Division. I was in the 1st Regiment, the 357th. I was in the 1st Battalion in the 357th. I was in the 1st Company in the 1st Battalion. I was in the 1st Platoon of the 1st Company, and I was in the 1st damn squad of the 1st of the first Platoon. <laughs> so that might give you some idea of how a company is, or how an infantry division is, is organized. I suppose uh, maybe I should begin, uh, I don't like to talk about myself, but I, it's the only topic I know very much about, so <laughs> I'll begin by uh, from day one when I got involved in military service. I was inducted in uh, Detroit, and that's that little town up north where there's another little team called Michigan State It's going to be playing basketball tonight. I was inducted in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, when it came time that I see that I was going to go in the Army, I thought that that would be the last place I wanted to go. So I tried to get into the Air Force. I had a brother in the Air Force at the time, and the Air Force didn't want me. and. Uh, my second choice was the Marines. Marines didn't want me, and uh, uh, third choice was the Navy, and the Navy didn't want me. I have a defective vision in my right eye that I've had since birth, and it could not be corrected. But when I came to the Army induction officer, 
one of his attendants put his hand on my bare shoulder and said, this guy is warm, we'll take him. <laughs> so, so I wound up then in the infantry uh, and was sent to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina for my basic training. Uh, I wound up probably having more training than very many people in the Army. Uh, from, from the 30 weeks of basic training, we went, to, went into Class D, so-called combat problems, and then from, in Georgia. From Georgia, we went to uh, Tennessee and Kentucky in preliminary combat maneuvers. Um, that training was with the 106th Infantry Division, which was a training division. And uh, as a, a trainee under the command of trainors, I didn't care much for the U.S. Army. <laughs> there is not much communication, as some of you old timers who may have been in in the service know, there's not much communication between a, a trainee and a trainor. <coughs> so I, I wound up with not too much respect, really, um, from my training in the States. I didn't have much respect for the officers, and the non-commissioned officers in the Army. Um, and I'll jump ahead just a little bit here to tell you that an officer in combat is a far different breed of cat from an officer in a training camp. So what little respect I had for the officers and the sergeants in training uh, was a different than the amount of respect I, I learned to have after I got into combat. Well, from, uh, from my, all the training in the States, which lasted about, I guess, 14 months, I was sent to uh, uh, Fort Dix and for preliminary getting my shots and indoctrination, getting ready for shipping overseas. And I was uh, as a replacement. After, after I'd had my training in the States, I had a furlough of, of two weeks and my papers read that after, at the end of my furlough, I was to uh, report back to uh, Camp Atterbury uh, near Indianapolis. So when I went back, there was nobody around from the 106th Division. The cadre from the 106th had moved on to train additional troops. So I knew nobody. I was completely alone as a replacement. I went to Fort Dix uh, by myself, uh, knowing no one else uh, that I had ever trained with. We got on a large transport ship uh, in uh, May of 1945 and uh, sailed uh, across the Atlantic in a troop ship that had uh, roughly 3,000 troops on it. Uh, I rather enjoyed the trip, really. I hadn't been on <laughs> my first sea journey and it was kind of fun. Uh, we landed in Glasgow and from Glasgow we took a train down to Southampton, England, on the southwestern border of England. And I remained there uh, under blackout conditions, uh, not knowing, of course, that the invasion was about to begin. Uh, it was complete blackout. There was no social activity. The camp was uh, very bare, um, very modest, to put it mildly, and had no idea that the invasion was about to take place. Uh, on the morning of uh, June 6th, uh, I could see uh, a lot of action. I couldn't hear anything. We were too far away. But the entire horizon was lit up like the sun was coming up all over, all at once. That's how bright it was uh, about four o'clock in the morning on the day of the invasion. Couldn't hear anything. Couldn't hear the naval guns, couldn't hear the bombardment, couldn't hear, but well, we knew that something big is happening. <clears throat> so 
so I remained, uh, remained in Southampton and still as a replacement. The camp was full of replacements. We didn't belong to anything or anybody, we didn't belong to any unit. Uh, we were all by ourselves and we were just classified as replacements. So I went overseas then in the combat as a replacement. Um, boarded a, we boarded a, a small troop ship in Southampton and uh, as you've probably seen in the movies, went over the side of the, of the ship on a rope ladder down into a small landing craft uh, that would land us on, on the shore of uh, Omaha Beach. This was the first part of July, so the war had been going on for almost a month by the time I got into it. But they weren't in very far. We walked to the front lines, I would guess maybe 12 or 15 miles to the front lines and walked to a, there was some sniper fire, but it was in the distance and they told us to spread out, like they're always hollering, spread out, spread out because of the sniper fire. So there were some small sniper fire, but not that amounted to very much. We walked to a staging area, and uh, there was a major at the staging area that gave us some more indoctrination about killing or being killed. And we still had our full field packs on. As some of you might know, and some of you might not know what a full field pack is. It's um, a pack that allows you to be able to live out in the open. Contains a blanket and a pup tent with your uh, pup tent bowl, uh, poles and mess kit and um, change of underwear and a, another uniform, your towel and personal items and anything that you wanted to take with you that you thought was important was in your full field pack. Well, the major said, take off your full field pack and throw it in that pile over there, guys, and it'll put your number on it and it'll catch up to you at a later date. What day is today? <laughs> I'm so waiting for that full fuel pack. <laughs> so after we unloaded our full fuel packs, we were loaded down with um, bandoliers of ammunition, and, uh, and the major said, just go over to location so-and-so, called off your name, and about 12 of us met into an area where there was a sergeant from the 90th Infantry Division, and he proceeded to uh, to take us to the front line. I would say this was early evening. Uh, I don't remember if we had anything to eat or not before, but anyway, on the way to the front lines, uh, we probably walked another <clears throat> four or five miles, and uh, the unit I was assigned to was dug in in the hedgerow in Normandy, and uh, I don't know if any of you know what a hedgerow is. You've probably read about them, but I can tell you. Uh, the farmers in France were not like the farmers here in the United States. Most of them lived in little villages, and they went out to their farm. Their farms were small, not like the farms we know around here. And their fields were not fenced in. They didn't have barbed wire fences or woven wire fences. Their fields were, were fenced in by hedgerows. The hedgerows, I, I presume, were constructed initially when they cleared the fields and took out the stumps and the brush and, and the dirt, and they uh, made these hedgerows, which were probably five or six feet in width at the base, and they came up sort of like to a point, but they were flat on the top, and they were, they, uh, the dirt and stone and so forth were about four foot high. Then above that was a very, very thick hedge, extremely thick, uh, so thick, uh, made up of hedgerows or hedge brush, maybe an inch, inch and a half thick, so thick you couldn't get through them. And the fields were small. Some of them maybe were a quarter of an acre, or a half an acre, maybe an acre. Some of them maybe as big as, as 10 acres, but they were relatively small. And each field was surrounded by these hedgerows. <clears throat> Excuse me. I 
should have had that cap off previously, but you can see I'm not very well prepared. Anyway, the hedgerows uh, you could get from one hedge, from one field that was surrounded by the hedgerows, there would be a gate, uh, an opening in the hedgerow where the farmer would go from one field to another, through which he could go with his team of horses and so forth from one field to another. <clears throat> but these openings were zeroed in uh, by enemy machine gun fire and uh, horizontal uh, anti-tank guns, tank guns and heavy, heavy mortars. And so when you went through those openings, you were dead. The first, this is what I was afraid would happen. So excuse me if I recall certain things. <clears throat> anyway, if you went through the openings, you didn't last very long. So we had to come up with some ideas as to how to get from one field to another. And some of the rear echelon brains, somebody from up here somewhere decided, well, we'll send some tanks along with the infantry guys, and these tanks can, can blow a hole through the hedgerow so the infantry can move on through into the next field. Well, uh, a lot of mistakes are made. There are a lot of mistakes made up here, a lot of mistakes made up here, a lot of mistakes here, and a lot of mistakes down here. Well, there was no training for the infantry to know how to cooperate with the tanks, and it was complete chaos. In Normandy, in the hedgerows, it was complete chaos and complete confusion. Uh, I read some books where it, uh, people who knew a lot more about the confusion than what I did. I saw the confusion, but I've read books where they knew about the confusion and knew why there was so much confusion. But anyway, this didn't work. When they sent the tanks in with the infantry, one of the reasons it didn't work was they said we had no training with the tank battalions, and they would put a tank under the command of the infantry lieutenant, and the infantry lieutenant had no training in, in uh, making usually hand directions, because there was so much noise, there was no verbal uh, connection with the tank commanders and tank drivers. So a lot of the tanks fired upon their own troops and killed their own troops. So that didn't work. Well, again, some, and sometimes there are, are some educated people up here. There are people who do know a few things. So somebody decided, well, we'll, we'll send some engineers up with the infantry and have the engineers come up with some and I've forgotten, maybe some of you people who've read the uh, war bus can tell me, I've forgotten. But they were pieces of pipe, maybe 10 or 8 or 10 foot long, 2 inch pieces of galvanized pipe, packed with dynamite and explosives, and with a, uh, a wick in one end of them. So the engineers brought those up to us in the infantry, and we crawled our way up to the hedgerow and picked a spot in the hedgerow and set off this uh, bandolier of, of dynamite. <clears throat> so that, that way we blew a hole through the hedgerows that the Germans did not expect, and that, that way we could get through the hedgerow without them getting their heavy weapons zeroed in. And that way was, was the way we went from one hedgerow to another. So progress was extremely low and very, very slow, and the casualties very, very high. Uh, it was probably sometime late in July before we got through Normandy and through the hedgerows and into more open country in France where <clears throat> we could move somewhat faster. And some of you have probably read about the, uh, the St. Lo breakthrough, uh, the Battle of Filet Gap where the Germans, where we surrounded <clears throat> like 200,000 Germans uh, gave up at the Battle of uh, uh, Filet Gap, and we thought the war was over. This was uh, in, I say, late July, 
early part of August. Uh, I'll mention here that my view of the war is entirely different from the view of almost anybody on this chart. My view of the war was extremely limited, extremely focused, uh, extremely narrow. Uh, to look at the war from the end of, from the, from out of a foxhole, you don't see very much. But what you see is very, very real. It was very, very limited, but very, very real. But it was a view entirely different from the view of a lot of other people uh, who have written about it and experienced it in, in different ways. And um, for the last four or five years, I've attended the 90th Infantry Division reunion. And <clears throat> I've picked up books by people in the 90th Division uh, for example, there was a book written by uh, Captain Murphy, who was the, uh, the chaplain of uh, the 1st Platoon. And I read his book. Well, here he is way down here close to where I was. But his book, I don't relate to it. <laughs> what he saw and what he wrote about was not what I saw, what I wrote about. Another example is that we had a um, uh, battalion surgeon, and I can't think of his name. I tried to find his book because I bought his book. I couldn't find it tonight. But anyway, um, he was a surgeon, a major, a surgeon in the 1st Battalion. So he was close to the front line, uh, but I saw him once. He cleaned out my wound before I, I went to the hospital. So he must have been the one that cleaned out my wound. And I never saw him but that one time. But he wrote a book. And I can't relate to his book either. You know, he's got a Jeep and a driver. And he <laughs> talked about going and seeing all the different towns and seeing all the different people and communicating with, with all the different people and the different units. And I didn't see anything like that. I don't even know if he was in the same war that I was. He says he was. but. <laughs> I, I really didn't know. Anyway, as I said, uh, my, if you read my book, it's not going to be the book that you might expect because it's, there are no statistics in the book. I never knew where I was. I never knew what time of the day it was, or I knew what time of the day it was, roughly. But I never knew where I was, or uh, what I was doing, or where I'd been, or where I was going, or what I was doing. Um, there are no statistics in the book. I never knew. One hill was the same as the next hill, and one town was the same as the next town. So uh, I don't have any facts and figures. I just have remembrances and episodes that I remember. My book is, is not, there are no separate chapters in it. Um, there's no chronological order of the book. I just wrote about some episodes that I remembered. And, that I was involved in. Um, so getting back to the St. Low and uh, Fleet Gap battle, from then on, uh, we moved a lot faster. The infantry at many times were loaded on trucks and half tracks and tanks. I rode the top of a tank many, many times. Uh, and we moved across France pretty fast. As I said, uh, we thought at that time the war was over. Uh, you capture 200,000 Germans, and they're on the run, and you're not doing a lot of fighting. Uh, the towns that we would go into, there would be some resistance, but not an awful lot of resistance. So uh, by the time we reached the German border, we thought the war was over. But as you've probably read, if you've read many of the stories about World War II, we, could, we ran out of supplies at the German border and ran out of gasoline. Patton, you know, you, Patton just loved to run with whatever he had until he ran out of it. That included gasoline, it included men, it included everything. But he loved to run with it. But when he got to the German border, 
Patton couldn't run anymore, so we had to stop and we had to dig in. So we dug in there, and, and um, uh, I was in a little town called uh, Maziere La Metz. It was a little town close to Metz, and we were holed up there for quite some time. When the supplies and stuff finally caught up to us, then the 90th Division swung down um, to the south along the border toward the southern part of Germany, and we crossed uh, the Saar River into Germany, and which is where I got wounded. Uh, it was a real lucky wound. It was uh, uh, not in any way serious. Um, in fact, I walked back to the battalion aid station where the surgeon patched me up and from there I went back to Paris, France, for uh, where I was hospitalized for six weeks. But I was hospitalized during the Battle of the Bulge, which you've often heard about and read about. And the 90th Division, which was down in the southern part of Germany, if you get a chance to look at the map, was down in here where we were, and the Battle of the Bulge took place up here in Belgium. I got wounded back down here and was fortunate enough to be in Paris when the Battle of the Bulge took place and the Germans came back across the border into Belgium. And incidentally, they came through the line that was occupied by the 106th Infantry Division, the division that I trained in. They subsequently, after I left the 106th, in Fort Jackson, they did organize into a fighting division <clears throat> and came over during the Battle of the Bulge. It was a brand new, brand new division, a brand new cadre of people, a brand new generals, brand new colonels, and completely filled with uh, incompetent and green troops from the common soldier up to the generals that, that ran the division. And the Germans knew this better than we did, and that's where they chose to uh, come back into Belgium. The 106th probably only had four or five days of combat. They were the division I trained with, and I had already been over there six months before they got over there. But it was a good thing, uh, maybe, that I never came over with the 106th, because most of them were annihilated in the Battle of the Bulge. When I left the hospital, I went by train back into Belgium and rejoined the 90th Division, which along with, I think, the 4th Division and the 29th Division, I'm not sure, but there were a couple of other divisions that Patton brought up then along the uh, border of Germany and attacked uh, the southern flank of the, the bulge that came in through here. Being in the hospital at the time, I, I could not believe that this could happen. As I said before, we thought the war was over six months before that. I could not fathom the idea that the Germans could ever mass an attack of, of, of that magnitude and come back into Belgium, because we had driven them out of Belgium with our, without too much trouble. But here they were back in again, and I got back um, in the middle of, well, toward the end of January, which would have been in 1945 when I rejoined my unit. Uh, most of the, the battle at that time, the Battle of the Bulge was over. However, I did see some action in it, and I got campaign credit for it, uh, which became important when it came time to be discharged because you got, you got credit. Uh, the discharge were based on points. You got points for every campaign you were in. You got, excuse me, you got points for your years of months of service. You got points for your age and so forth. Anyway, whoever designed, some of these people back here designed the system, uh, it was to my advantage to have been in all the campaigns. And, uh, I was probably the only rifleman. I know when we go to these reunions, and they have the people stand up who've been in uh, each campaign. And I'm probably the only rifleman that went through all five campaigns. Uh, I have no idea why. Uh, 
Well, I can't tell you why. Um, I was not a I was not a gung ho soldier. I had no in, uh, intention or any desire to be a hero. I turned down um, uh, promotions more than once. Um, I didn't want the responsibility. I kind of get off onto a tangent here, and I forgot what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, oh, I got campaign credit for, for being in the Battle of the Bulge. And after uh, the Battle of the Bulge, and we uh, forced the Germans back across their border in the Germany, uh, fighting in Germany was, was much slower than fighting in northern France. Uh, it was, it was, we would take city by city and town by town and village by village. Uh, but it was still relatively fast, certainly compared to the battles in Normandy. Um, we wound up, um, when the war ended, I was in Czechoslovakia and um, we came back into Germany after the armistice was signed and the 90th Division then was headquartered in Weiden, Germany. If you're familiar with the geography of Germany, Weiden was in the north central part of Germany and a beautiful part of Germany. Uh, our particular company was billeted in the schoolhouse um, in a little town called Walsassen, Walsassen, Germany. And uh, I loved it there. It was. That's where I had that picture taken, was in Walsassen. Uh, the Germans did everything for us. Uh, they kept the place spotless. They cooked our food for us. Uh, and I would have liked to stay in Walsassen, to be honest with you, for a few months. Uh, but because I had these 87 points and you only needed 85 to be discharged, these people up here decided, well, let's, let's send these guys home that have points enough so they took me out of Walsassen and sent me to Larve for shipping back to the States. Uh, so I was looking forward to going home. By that time, I had had 33 months service. So I was looking forward to going home. But again, uh, some of the brains up here said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. These, these guys are too old. And we still got a war going on in Japan. These guys are too old. There's no sense of sending them home. We can't use them again anyway. They're ready, they're ready to be discharged. So let's take these young fellows that didn't have but 20 or 25 or 30 points, and we'll send them home first, and maybe, because maybe we'll need them in Japan. So us old guys that were sitting in La Havre suddenly got shipped down to Marseille, Marseille or Marseille, France. And there I sat for five months waiting for shipping home while the younger guys that only had 25 or 30 points came back to the United States. And they were in the States when the war ended with Japan and they got discharged six months before I did. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. <laughs> uh, I'll talk a little bit about books. Um, I've read several war books, war stories. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good, in my opinion. But there have been some great historians, some great writers, some who never, never saw combat, but they knew enough about it to, to write about it and write well. Of course, the, probably the most famous one was um, uh, Ernie Pyle, who probably uh, saw the war pretty much the way I saw the war. Uh, he was down in the down in the foxholes and and talked to the guys that were in the foxholes and did a pretty good, an excellent job of writing about it. But there are other great writers. Tom Brokaw wrote some great um, stories about the war. It was very knowledgeable. Uh, Stephen Ambrose, who died just last, I think last year, a year and a half ago. I happen to have the opportunity to have a little bit of a connection with Mr. Ambrose. He had, he had had an article in the Plain Dealer asking for 
World War II veterans to submit some of their experiences to him <clears throat> and because he was writing a book. Uh, he wrote several books. Uh, the one he was working on at the time was Voices of D-Day. And he also wrote the Remagen Bridge, not the Pegasus Bridge. He also wrote from the point of view of the, the defenders, the point of view of the Germans. So in my opinion, he was one of the best, I think, uh, World War II historian. Um, I had my name in one of the books uh, by, uh, I think his name was McManus. McManus uh, wrote a book. It's called Americans in Normandy by John McManus. And 90th Division was talked about in that book. But I found some discrepancy in that book because he quoted me in that book. And he took some quotations out of the book that I wrote, uh, which I sent to the Eisenhower um, Museum in New Orleans. So McManus got most of the information for his book from the Eisenhower Museum in New Orleans, but he did not quote me. <laughs> what he said about me, I don't remember. <laughs> so uh, that's a kind of, some of the stuff that you read about uh, is conjecture. Some of it's true, some of it's not true. This fellow that, that's on 60 Minutes at the end of it, uh, what's his name? Um, Andy, Rooney. Andy Rooney. He wrote a book called My War. And he was, at the time, he was a um, correspondent and was attached to the 8th Air Force uh, unit in England. And he wrote about the 8th Air, the Air, 8th Air Force very well. He, he worked with him, he even went on a combat mission with him. He knew, what he, he knew what he was talking about. But he wanted to get just a little more information about the war at the ground, at the ground level. So he joined an uh, armored battalion and was in France with the armored battalion. But there were some discrepancies in his book that I, it bothered me. One of the things he said in that was that the, the, he, he was in there about the time they formed the Third Army. And he said the Third, third Army troops were all green troops. So they had not seen any combat at that point. They were just getting into combat. Uh, and this was in about the end of August. Well, he was completely wrong in that, completely wrong, because the Third Army was made up from units that had been in combat and were in the First Army. And they formed a couple of corps out of the First Army and they established the Third Army under Patton. So uh, he was way off base in that regard. And there's a lot of that, a lot of that writing, I think, was incorrect. They may have met well, but they were, they were wrong. Uh, I tried to write him, by the way, and straighten him out. But, <laughs> but he never got my letter or he ignored it, I don't know. I never, I never got a response from him anyway. <clears throat> Well, I, I think my voice and my uh, my comments are, I had some notes here. I should have followed them, I guess. <laughs> um, I think I've covered it pretty much. When the war ended and I finally got home, and I never talked about my experiences. Never wanted to. Some people do, some people don't, and I was one that didn't. Uh, I had four brothers died, and my parents died, and my sister died, and none of them knew that I had seen the, or had the experiences. They knew I was in the war, of course, and they knew that I got wounded, but I, I never talked to any of them about it. Uh, my wife is here. I was, my wife and a good portion of my family is here, uh, which I appreciate very much. By the way, the, their, their duty at this talk was to 
tap anybody on the shoulder that fell asleep. So, <laughs> fortunately, they haven't been too active back there. But anyway, I started to say my wife was married to me probably 45 years before she ever knew that I had been in, in seen the things that I had seen. Um, I never talked about, never wanted to. But in 1995, Stephen Ambrose had this little blurb in the in the plane dealer, and I contacted him, and he sent me a tape, and I put some information on the tape. Then I had a call from a reporter of the plane dealer, and she asked me a lot of questions, and uh, I said things to her I'd never said to anybody else about my war experiences, and she said, "Well, you ought to write them down." Uh, for your family and for posterity, because you guys are dying off. <laughs> there are not many of you left. So she kind of talked me into writing it. So I, I started to write uh, the book, and uh, it was full of a lot of mistakes, a lot of grammatical errors, spelling errors. But I had it printed anyway in Medina. I made it only just a few copies. I think I had about 25 copies printed for the family. And, for some close friends, and one of the one of the friends that, of our family was Marguerite Cunningham, who used to be the principal here at Saint Saint Francis Church. So I sent her a copy of my book, and she uh, got she she called me and she said, uh, "I'll correct your mistakes and correct your spelling and <laughs> your pronunciation if you promise to have it have it published." So. Uh, she, I said, okay, I'll, I'll need some help. But anyway, um, through her effort and the effort of my family, and particularly Beth, who helped organize uh, the book, and Beth dug out some stuff that my mother had from her old scrapbook. So we finally came up with the book that is now for sale. Anybody would have any questions of any kind? Yes, sir. Did you encounter any Russian troops while you were over there? The question was, uh, did I encounter any Russian troops? And the answer is no. I did not encounter any Russian troops. Uh, probably were close to them at one time, but no, I did not encounter any Russian troops. I did encounter some Italian troops. Um, it was after the war was over, or pretty much over. Not quite over, but pretty much over. It was in the last three or four days within the Armistice State, and there were a bunch of Italian troops up in the woods that uh, were ready to give up. They wanted to give up to the American troops to avoid giving up to the Russian troops. So our, our company, or our, our platoon, I think it was just a platoon, went up and um, uh, removed the weapons from the, the Italian soldiers, and they gave up. Uh, incidentally, I, I got a, uh, I got, I took an Italian Beretta off of an Italian soldier, and I was not familiar with it. I carried a German Mauser with me during combat, but I, I, I never carried an, an Italian Beretta. It was a cute little pistol. So I, I took it out after we got back. We were billeted in the, uh, in the schoolhouse at the time, and I brought it back, and I went out to target practicing and brought it back, and was cleaning it and put it back together again. And when I jammed the uh, magazine into it, it went off and blew my little finger off. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, that was not, I did not get the Purple Heart for that. They, <laughs> that's called an SIW, a self-inflicted wound. <laughs> Fortunately, the lieutenant, Lieutenant Rogers, who was a good friend of mine, and the uh, medic was in the room at the same time I was. So they testify that it was an accident and not intentional. So, <laughs> uh, yes, any other questions? I, I One, uh, thank, yeah. first of all, thank, thank you very much for taking the time and sharing your experiences with us all. Ha have, you, have you been back to Europe? Uh, I guess two parts. If the answer is no, then maybe. <laughs> have, have you been back to Europe? Well, since? I've been back to York a couple of times, but I have not gone back to France. I, Kind of sorry and not sorry. I, um, I don't know if I can handle it. Yeah. 
what you have seen from going back to Europe and, and seeing the geography and seeing the way the trains are laid out and so forth, has it, has it changed how you think and, and how you approached it? Because as you mentioned, on the ground and when you were moving around, going from the hedgerows and so forth, but, uh, but see, seeing things and, and, and getting a broader perspective? Uh, not so far as the total war is concerned. I, it didn't give me a broader perspective. We did, the wife and I took a trip through Germany a few years ago, and we went through some of the territory that I had, that had covered during combat, and it was so changed, so different. I recognized nothing. We went through the city of Munich, for example, when I saw Munich the first time, all there was, was were walls with no rooms and chimneys with no rooms and complete destruction. When I saw it the second time, I could not believe it. I absolutely couldn't believe it. Uh, I know that we had a lot to do, probably 90% to do with the way German, Germany was rebuilt after the war, but I give the Germans credit. Uh, they really knew how to rebuild that country and rebuild it well. Uh, we came within just a few miles on our on the trip with the wife and I of, of uh, uh, Buchenwald, and the German driver of the bus would not mention it, did not mention it, did not take us there. I would have liked to have seen it, but. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have a two-part question. Uh, the first part is you mentioned uh, that you did some of your uh, training, your, what we call like AIT, in in Kentucky. Did you were you at Fort Knox or Fort Campbell, by any chance no, for your training? No. Uh, when I was in Kentucky and Tennessee, it was um, simulated combat maneuvers, and we stayed out all the time in tents. And I have to admit that the training I got was, it came in handy in combat. Physically, I found combat easier than my training in Kentucky and Tennessee. And I'm not being facetious about that at all. I was in good shape. I was in excellent shape when I hit the front lines. And the few people who were on the front lines when I, when I first got there had very little training. I was amazed. I think FDR said that nobody would be shipped overseas without a minimum of 13 weeks of basic training. The five or six guys that were dug in on the hedgerow when I got there uh, had eight and nine weeks of training. That's all. I had had 14 weeks of training. And when we, we went into that first attack that I can recall quite vividly, and I was in great physical shape. I could run and I could crawl and I could do a lot of things that the guys that I fought with could not. So my training did come in handy. And it's in the book, but I'll very briefly tell you that uh, I was given the task of taking a battery to the command post. Uh, so I thought, well, here's a chance to get getting back in the line. Command post to me meant somebody back several miles with maybe an orderly and a clerk. And so I grabbed this battery and I went down along the hedgerow and went through a hole in the hedgerow and went along some more hedgerows and finally got over to the command post. Well, the command post was a, was a foxhole and there was a second lieutenant in the foxhole. And he was a company commander. And uh, I laid on my stomach and he asked me a lot of questions, and uh, he said, you have had more training than any man in the company. And because of that, he said, uh, I want you to take charge of those men that you are dug in with on the left flank of the first platoon. I said, sir, I am so damn scared, I don't want to take care of everybody else, I can't take care of myself. <laughs> Anyway, that's how desperate they were for people. And when he got through talking to me, he said, by the way, soldier, you're in combat now and you don't go anywhere without your rifle. In my, in my scared condition, 
I left my rifle by my foxhole when I grabbed the battery and took it over to the command post. And they were so hard up for uh, uh, sergeants and non-commissioned officers that he offered me a commission not when I didn't even know enough to have a rifle with me. <laughs> the second part, um, this is like a long shot. Did you by any chance know a sergeant by the name of Clifford Grady? He was in Patton's Third Army. He was captured at the Battle of the Bulge. I mean, that's a long shot, but. No, I get asked this all the time at our reunions that I know so and so and so and so. For two reasons. Uh, the main one is they don't last long enough to get acquainted with them. Uh, uh, the war was almost over before I got to know my own sergeants. Uh, the one sergeant that I recall and wrote about in my book came over as a private and had gone, he was a natural leader and he'd come through the ranks very, very fast. He came over with the 359th, subsequently got transferred to the 357th and got transferred to Company A and he was killed. He, uh, before I got to know him too well. But he was already in for a battlefield commission for a first lieutenant when I met him in that short time. And he came over as a private, like I did. But apparently I'm a much better leader than <laughs> what I ever proposed to be. And the last part of it is um, the Bronze Star. You, you, I know you didn't mention anything, maybe you're not comfortable, but that's a pretty impressive thing to, to earn. And um, maybe you could just tell us what what the citation said. If you know, if you're, it's not too hard. Well, I don't know the the citations that that in the presentation of the Bronze Star was not exactly as I remember them, but they were pretty close to what it, to what actually happened. But the, there were a lot of Bronze Stars issued. Bronze Star is probably the least amount of uh, combat uh, meritorious uh, awards that you can get. You know, there's Silver Stars, there's Distinguished Service Crosses, there's a lot of, a lot of, lot higher stars that are granted. So there are a lot of Bronze Stars. You don't go around talking about your Bronze Star very much. And I don't think anybody that receives any uh, meritorious award wants to talk about it. Um, there is an episode in the book <laughs> about the, uh, the incident from which the Bronze Star was awarded. Um, I, other than that, I don't particularly want to talk about it. I had one, one question. I had heard that the 90th Division was involved in recovering some of the uh, famous artwork that the Germans had uh, taken, and I was wondering if you had any information on that. I think you read the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, um, our company, Company A, uh, liberated the town of Merkers, Germany. Merkers, Germany um, was a small city, smaller than Medina, and it was built on a salt mine. The Germans utilized the salt mine to uh, store art treasures that they had secured from various places in Europe and the gold. Uh, best we don't ask where they got all the gold. But the salt, at the bottom of the salt mine was this storage room probably about 15, 12, 15 foot square. <clears throat> and the natives of Mercury, uh, of Merkers, told us where this room was and where it could be found at the bottom of the salt mine. So uh, we blew a hole through the side of this. It was all bricked up. The brick walls were about that thick. And we blew a hole through the, through the wall of the storage facility and it was the room was filled with art treasures and treasure and gold. 
And um, since our company had uh, taken the town to begin with, uh, we were given the R and R uh, in markers. The battle had moved on, and markers was probably about 20, 20 miles behind the line when they sent us back uh, for R and R in the city of Merkers. So I had a chance and uh, to see the mine, to see the gold, and to see some brass, because um, I, I happened to be acting sergeant. I was acting sergeant a lot. I never made sergeant, but I was a better actor than I was anything else. So, <laughs> so I happened to be an acting sergeant in charge of the detail at the bottom of the mine when General Eisenhower, General Bradley, uh, General Patton, some minor generals and some senators and uh, a lot of, lot of top brass came down to the mine to look at the art treasure and look at the, the gold. So I was there when they brought the gold up out of the mine. The gold was packaged in, in two bricks to a sack. They were like a burlap sack with two bricks of gold in each sack. And I was not on the work detail that brought the gold up out of the mine, but I was, as I said, I was an acting sergeant and watched the gold come up out of the mine. We loaded it on a uh, flatbed, uh, huge military semi-trucks, and uh, they laid one layer of that gold on the flatbed and I'll tell you, that semi was in low gear when they pulled out of there. Uh, I think somebody told me it was 62 pounds to a bag. That's what the goal weighed. Uh, they're still trying to find out yet today, I think, what happened to all the art treasure that was found in Merkur, Germany. They're still trying to track it down. Some of the, some of the owners uh, initially have received their art treasury back. What happened to all the gold, I don't know whether a lot of it, I guess, ended up in Fort Knox, but I think a lot of it went who knows where. Thank you for your question. Yes? How old were you when you enlisted? 20. Five or six. 20 years old. <laughs> Five or six. I was 20, let's see, that was in 45, or 22 when that picture was taken. Any other questions? Yes, sir. On uh, uh, what weapon were you issued as an infantry <laughs> man, and what were your pros and cons of that weapon? <clears throat> I was the smallest guy in the Army, I think. I certainly was the smallest guy in our company. So I was issued the Browning Automatic Rifle. <laughs> the Browning Automatic BAR, they call them. Uh, BARs I was familiar with. But I was not familiar with the Browning Automatic. <laughs> anyway, the, the Browning Automatic uh, weighed about twice as much as the M1. So I went overseas as a BR man classification. Um, but they were smarter. The people in combat are smarter than the people who, who put us in training. And they realized that this guy shouldn't be handling a BAR. So I was issued an M1 rifle and fought the war with an M1 rifle. Uh, I eventually became a platoon runner, which is the guy that's attached to the lieutenant. They help the lieutenant carry his equipment. The lieutenant, uh, the infantry lieutenant, carries quite a bit of equipment. They, they carry uh, goggles, they carry maps, and they carry a sidearm, they carry a uh, radio and the um, smaller rifle, the carbine carry a carbine. So anyway, somebody decided that the, the infantry lieutenant thought they have a runner to help him. So that was a job that I got and I somewhat enjoyed. I got a little bit because I was a, the, I carried a, the radio. So I, uh, I felt a little more important, you know, and some of the guys in the platoon, they thought I was in direct contact with General Eisenhower. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I thank you all. Yes, I'll what take another one. Pardon me? What line of work did you go into and do you live here? I live in Medina. After the war was over, I, I went to work for an oil company in Michigan. 
and I got transferred some, quite a few times. So I was transferred from Michigan to Toledo, and from Toledo I was transferred back to Michigan, and then from Michigan I was transferred to, to uh, uh, Springfield, Illinois, and from Springfield, Illinois I was transferred to Cleveland, and from Cleveland I was supposed to go to Passaic, New Jersey, and I turned down that transfer and thank God, once you turn down a transfer, they leave you alone. Because at that time, we had seven children. And my good wife had to do all of the, take care of all the details uh, in these transfers. And if you've ever worked for an oil company, uh, they don't give you much notice. I'd get a call and, and say, what are you doing? And I'd say, well, they'd say, sit down. And I'd sit down and they'd say, I want you in Springfield, Illinois. I'd say, when? Tomorrow morning. <laughs> so we were living at that time in, in uh, Northville, Michigan, and I had just we just had, we bought an old house in Northville, and I had just completed the third bathroom in Northville, Michigan, and hadn't taken a shower yet in the last bathroom before I got transferred to Springfield, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a lot of fun. And my wife's looking at her watch back there. She hasn't, she hasn't shaken it yet. When they start shaking their watch, then I guess it's time to quit. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for coming. <laughs>